January 24th. The cold winter air in Alaska is punctured by an all too familiar sound. They were taking on water. They didn't know if they could stay afloat and it sounded pretty serious. The events of the next 14 hours will push the entire crew of Air Station Kodiak to their limits. I don't know if we can hold this stable enough to go I've never been so terrified, to be honest with you. It had us rocking in our seats. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here, every day, 350 highly trained men and women risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. About an hour ago, a call from D-17, 58-foot fishing vessel with four adult males on board. The location of the vessel is across the Shelikov Strait in Portage Bay. It's about 113 miles west-southwest of Kodiak. And that's all the information we have. We don't know if they're sinking. We don't know if there's some kind of medical needs. So right now, we're just sort of speculating what the problem on the vessel is. OK, just to update, 58-foot vessel possibly beached in distress, four adult males on board. The captain contacted his wife via sat phone. She contacted the Coast Guard, and they are requesting assistance. The plan is it's about 150 miles from here. We're going to try to climb up over the top of the island and go direct. Anyone have any questions about what we're doing? Sure. OK, as soon as they get the plane gassed up, we'll go. When the captain of the vessel was talking to his wife on the sat phone, it was cut off, and they couldn't get any, any contact. That was the last communications they have with the vessel. And uh, Sector's been trying to hail the fishing vessel Kimberly with no luck. So we don't want to waste any time. We started working towards getting in the aircraft. We knew there was four people on board, and uh, they were hard to ground. Our main concern was making sure we could get out there in a timely manner. It was up in Alaska. It's always cold out. and. If they had gone in the water for any reason, their survivability rate goes down significantly. This is where we're clearing. Yes, cleared in. System uh, instruments look good, flight instruments look good, everything's on the green. The thing about Alaska that makes it so difficult is most of the time we don't even know exactly what the weather is we're flying into. We are always making a conscious decision to evaluate the risk we're taking against the gain that we might have and we're willing to take a lot of risk for the chance of saving human life. Kodiak Air from 6005. Work fly 100% speed is on. CIS is manual. We programmed in the flight director a straight line path to the last known position of the vessel in distress. And as we were getting closer and closer, we noticed the weather was quickly deteriorating over Shellpop Strait. The wind picked up it was at 50 knots, and then we were seeing sustained winds 60 to 70 knots. At that point, we were able to establish radio communications with the vessel skipper. Roger, roger. Everything is going to have to get off the uh, really banging hard. I don't know how long it's going to hold together here. We were talking to them, and we fixed their position at that point. It was in a cove that was at the base of two pretty large mountains. And we were looking at sometimes up to 100 knots of wind coming in, which is pretty much equivalent to a Category 3 hurricane. OK. So, uh, Josh, let's try to get the uh, trail line to where they're at. OK, so again. We determined that we were going to try to drop a trail line down to them and then use that to guide a rescue device to the vessel. We dropped down to about 3,000 feet, but we started picking up updrafts coming off of the mountains. And at one point, we had all of the power taken out of the plane, and we were still climbing at 1,000 feet per minute. So we were physically unable to descend. They are in a uh, narrow cove with the winds that are uh, swirling, 75 gusting to 85, maybe 90. I've never been so terrified, to be honest with you. It, it, it had us rocking in our seats. The wind was so strong, it was just pushing us over. Basically, it took us two hours to, to get five miles in a small cove that would have taken only seconds on a clear day to transit. The winds have never been that bad on any flight that I've ever been on. 
And what made it worse was it was dark out, so it was rough. After almost two hours, we finally made it over top of the vessel. Rest checklist complete, ready for one. Trail line delivery to the uh, survivors. Hey, if that trail line gets fouled up, you can just let it go. Roger. There's a lot of snag hazards and really strong winds, so this is a high uh, risk 100 evolution, feet. without 100 a doubt. Roger, I'm to site. And trail line is gone out the door. And begin the hoist. Trail line's gone down. Trail line's gone down. Sailing way aft. I put 20 pounds of weight on the end of the trail line. As soon as it went out the door, it went backwards. Just straight back behind the aircraft. I've never seen it do something like that. The force of the wind was incredible. It was 20 pounds on the trail line felt like 100 pounds. The wind just wanted to take it away from me. The sailing way too far Abort the hoist. Abort the hoist. It was a pretty dicey situation. If the trail line that went out the door contacted the tail rotor, that could be a catastrophic event. Josh, were we even close? No, sir. I think so. That's why I boarded. What do you guys think? I don't know. We can put James down. Yeah, but we do direct deployment to the water of James and have them just enter the water one at a time. What do you think about that, James? He's, uh, he's vomiting back here. Bye. Okay. And that uh, motor vessel can't play from the uh, Coast Guard helicopter. Uh, we just made an attempt to get the trail line down. The wind is blowing way too hard for us to get that uh, trail line down on deck. Okay. James, are you in any condition to swim right now? I think we ought to at least try. Okay. Got it. And rescue briefing. Okay, we're going to try the uh, same spot. Hey, Roger. And the uh, motor vessel can't really from the helicopter. We're going to try and get our swimmer down to the uh, roof of the cabin. What he'll do is he'll take uh, each of you one by one and hook you up to his drop. Okay, Roger, Roger. We're all ready here. We came up with possibly delivering the rescue swimmer directly on the cable. Since he had weight, we could deliver him, hopefully try to deliver him straight down. Keep in mind, during this whole evolution, the wind's blowing, and it's got to be about negative 30 degrees with the wind chill. My face was completely frozen, and my hands were getting pretty numb. We were about 50 feet from the vessel, and the helicopter was getting thrown around violently, up and down, backwards and forwards. Are you guys looking out the door? Yes, sir. I don't, I don't know if we can hold this stable enough to uh, hoist. I was about to go out the door, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? It's a toll on your body. I'm sure I was white as a ghost. We're not going to be able to hold a good enough cover for this, sir. Yeah, it, it gets too much worse when we get down there near the boat. It's going to be all over the place, and he's going to be way at risk for that. OK, board the board that way. Yeah, Roger, sir, morning. You tell him that, uh, man, I don't even know what to say. There's no way we can get these guys off this boat. Not without risking, you know, risking too much. Well, I mean, we can't even get a device to their boat physically. I mean, it's not even really a point of risk anymore. You know what I mean? And putting them in the water, I think, is a death sentence. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the game over. And, uh, Kimberly from the Coast Guard helicopter. Yeah, I got you. And Roger, Skipper, uh, at this time, there's nothing we can get out of the, uh, the helicopter and down to your vessel to get you guys off right now. And I'm just not comfortable asking you guys to get in the water. We're reaching bingo fuel for us, so we're going to have to head back to base. If you guys lose your generator, are you going to have any other source of heat on that boat? No, we don't. Yeah. Everything's out, stove's out, uh, and the generator's going out. So, uh, no, we don't. There's another chopper going to head out right away. When the Coast Guard shows up on scene, a lot of people think we're rescued. And in those conditions, we know that that is not the case, that there's a lot more that has to go on. And when we had to leave scene, I realized what a psychological blow that can be to people that are counting on us to rescue them. Roger, Captain, we're going to have another air crew start up another aircraft and uh, start heading out this way. It was extremely tough to tell the captain that we weren't going to be able to affect the hoist that night. You know, there's nothing more as a crew that we wanted uh, than to get those guys off the boat and bring them home safe. But we couldn't do it. Uh, Coast Guard helicopter, Kimberly. And Kimberly, Coast Guard helicopter. Yeah, she's ready to roll over here. She's ready to roll over. Uh, Coast Guard helicopter.
there, Kimberly. And Kimberly Coast Guard helicopter. Yeah, she's ready to roll over here. She's ready to roll over. The call came in from the air station ODO. There was a vessel hard aground on the uh, south side of the Alaska Peninsula, about 110 miles from air station Kodiak. There was four persons on board, all male. Sounded like there were no injuries, but they were pretty scared. And Captain Roger understood the uh, vessel uh, situation is deteriorating, and uh, you believe the vessel may roll over. And Captain, do you have a life raft? Roger, we do. Sector Anchorage. Just wanted to pass you. Uh, we did attempt uh, to hoist. We were unable to get any device even in contact with the vessel. We are uh, reaching critical fuel here. We're going to have to go back to base here to gas up. It was very difficult to fly away from the vessel because we knew they were still really in a lot of distress, but we simply did not have enough fuel and we did not have the capability to get them off of that boat at that time. On the way back, the crew was exhausted. But what we did was we started turning our focus from not only what we had done, but evaluating what information we could provide to the command and to the next crew that had to go out that might help them be able to have a better chance of uh, being successful based on what we learned in the couple of hours that we spent in those conditions. How's it going? OK, scare yourself. A little bit. Just saying. I feel, beat, I feel beat up, you know, bummed out about it. I had, I was about to put James out the door, man, and it was just like, yeah. Well, you look at you guys all look a little shook up, for sure. I've never been that terrified before on a flight. Yeah. That was bad. That was a, a teeth clencher. You know, and it's the kind of thing you don't want to see when you get out there. You know you're going to go out in bad weather, but you don't expect it to be that bad. When, when you got to take an hour to get five miles because the wind's pushing you back. And you see the guys on the boat, you know, they need your help and you can't get them. It's really disheartening. I'm, I'm beat up, beat, I'm done. Come on in, take your vest off. Let's talk about this a little bit. Relax, you guys uh, take a breather. What was alarming to me was my first reaction when I saw the crew that had been out there. When I saw their eyes, they looked beat up. Worst conditions they've ever been in. And when you're looking at two experienced pilots like that, Audie Andre and Jake Smith, when the top of the top tells you that it's bad out there, it, it's hard to send another crew out into that situation. It's just covered with ice. Significant winds. I mean, are we on the North Shore? How were they? Oh, North Bay. Turbulence wise. In the bay. See this bay right here? Yep. Kind of Jeez. a mountain in each side and then a high area. Like just to the stern of the vessel, a couple hundred yards is like a rocky shore. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we, we talked about everything. We kind of ran out of gas and ideas. You know, we kept trying until we uh, got to our bingo fuel. Mm -hmm. They've got dry suits on. They had a generator with lights. We didn't think it was safe to get them off the boat. We were looking at you know 80 to 90 mile an hour winds which is uh, difficult in any situation, uh, let alone at night, uh, 100 feet off the water. And having just two phenomenal pilots coming back and telling me that it's really, really bad out there just made me really reconsider, you know, what's the gain of this flight uh, if we're gonna put our crew at this much risk? It doesn't sound like we can do the hoist where we are right now, not in those conditions. Those guys sound scared? Yeah, they sounded like they knew that uh, the situation was, uh, was dangerous. They wanted to get off that boat, and we wanted to get them off that boat. There was no, that, that was what needed to happen. Anytime you walk in and you see the skipper there at 2 o'clock in the morning, not only do you know it's complicated, but you know you're, you know the, the boss has got your back, and crews appreciate that. We thought about uh, getting the helicopter out there just to stay above them. Just we did. Things really good. If you're above 3,000 feet, you could orbit there, and you, you'd be OK. Yep, so why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, orbit above and maybe the winds will die down and you can go in and pick them up? Yes, sir. Yeah. Let, me, let me get that going. OK. All 
Our crews try to be as prepared as they possibly can, but you never really know everything. It was important to me to let them know exactly what I expected of them, and that was, uh, I need you on scene, I need you to be there in case things get worse, but don't push it too hard. I'm already bleeding. So is it good if you start bleeding now? Just get it over with. <laughs> I feel comfortable, a little bit scared, but I'm gonna go do this because, you know, these, these people are counting on us. It makes you evaluate what you're getting into as a pilot. Not only is it my duty to go out and help save these people, but it's also my responsibility as a pilot to make sure that my crew stays safe and that we can get back home. It was freezing, probably negative 20 degrees Celsius with a 60 knot crosswind, blowing snow. Those conditions are something you read about and something you don't fly in. All right, at 2030, D-17 reports 50 foot fishing vessel Run aground 113 miles south southwest of here. Four POB. They have survival suits. So we get out there, they find the vessel, but they can't get down to it because of the winds. I don't know if we can hold this stable enough to hoist. going to be all over the place and he's going to be way at risk for that. Okay, abort, abort that hoist. Yeah, Roger, sir, morning. They said it was really, really sporty. We'd come to the decision once we launched the second aircraft that we're gonna basically keep coverage with a 60 on scene. So as soon as the second crew went out there, we called in another crew to engage and talk about the situation and the on scene conditions. Airspeed indicator around 95 knots trying to do a hoist. No opportunity whatsoever putting the trail line down with a ton of weight bags on it, just blew right back to the tail. So the real deal, serious stuff. We're not out there right now trying to do a hoist. We're orbiting in case they come off because we're worried as soon as they hit the water, they're going to be gone and we're never going to see them again. So we're going to want to be in a position to strike pretty fast. So we're trying to keep 100% coverage and literally relieve. When those guys leave, you're there. Um, it's nasty. The flight crews um, that came back, you saw it in their face. Seeing the real deal, be careful. Yeah. We were really counting on that third crew to be the crew that hoisted these folks. We knew that the second crew was there just to kind of be ready in case things went worse but we were counting on the third crew being the one to get them out of there. We had already launched two helicopters out there. They had been unable to hoist the individuals off the boat uh, because of 90 plus knot winds. We do a lot of severe weather in Alaska, but 90 plus knots is something I've actually never heard of. We knew it was gonna be a turbulent area and uh, I, I've flown through some bad turbulence before, but those conditions are something you read about and something you don't fly in. I put the other 60 out, they got three hours, and they're basically doing passing in the sky. I'd like the full coverage when the sun comes up if these guys are not on the boat for, yeah. for all of daylight time. All right. Anytime you send another crew out into a position, into a situation that uh, an earlier crew is unsuccessful, there's a lot of things that, uh, that I'm worried about. Number one is, uh, are they going to feel extra pressure to, um, to get the job done? I really didn't want our crews pushing too hard and, uh, God forbid, crashing the helicopter. I think what I'm hearing about guys getting sick and stuff, it's probably a good thing that we start uh, getting ready to just start leaving crews here until we figure out what's going on. And a takeoff time, sure. By that time, we had called every H-60 pilot and crew member because we knew this was going to be an all-hands-on-deck type evolution. We grabbed a couple pilots that were scheduled to go off-island on leave, called them in and said, sorry, you'll have to take your vacation some other time. We need you now. We were launching aircraft and planning and then we heard the second Mayday call for a second star case. We've lost all engines. We've taken out massive water. We are drift. We have seven people on board. This is a different uh, case, isn't it? I think it is. Sounds like it is. Where is it? Yowzy. OK, we currently have a 60 on scene with the fishing vessel Kimberly, but we just received another Mayday call from another fishing vessel. The fishing vessel 
heritage. We had just launched another helicopter to the fishing vessel Kimberly. And about as soon as they got airborne, we got a pretty bad mayday call that came over with a fishing vessel heritage saying they were taken on water. They didn't know if they could stay afloat, and it sounded pretty serious. But the heritage of the United States Coast Guard Sector Anchorage, Roger Captain, you've lost engines at this time. We're on board your vessel as the water coming in, over. The water came in from the driven place. Right now we are drift. We have uh, 20 degrees left. We were really stretched thin with the first case, but when the second case popped up, uh, we really started scrambling. <laughs> We got about halfway to scene, and we started hearing the uh, fishing vessel Heritage saying that they were taken on water, the engine room was flooded, they had a 20 degree list, and uh, pretty much dead in the water. on the fishing vessel Kimberly that was aground on the southwest corner of uh, Shellykoff Strait. And about 20 minutes into the flight, we heard a second mayday and uh, kind of figured out that that second case was only about 50 miles from where we were. We've lost all engines. We've taken on massive water. We are dressed. We started discussing, you know, which one is really the more important case at this point. You know, we got guys aground, and we got guys who are probably going in the water. So we made basically a 90 degree left-hand turn and made our way towards the heritage. We start descending through the clouds, and as we start approaching the boat, I see these flashing lights in the water. At first, we thought uh, the flashing lights might be buoys, but we realized pretty quickly they were actually uh, strobe lights from people in the water. Uh, it turns out the fishing vessel had completely sunk in 25 minutes. And we had uh, two people in the water and a life raft with five people in it. We immediately knew that we had to get the people out of the water first. Uh, the people in the life raft, although cold, were going to last a lot longer than folks in water that's, you know, 32 degrees or less. In 32 degree water, even with a survival suit, survivability is, is pretty limited in calm water. These people were in 25 foot swells with waves breaking over their head. Uh, we actually saw both survivors get tumbled in breaking waves while we we're doing our checklist. Rescue checklist complete. Ready for direct swimmer to the rescue swimmer. Roger, check Summer. Roger, check Summer. Summer's going out the door for load check. We came up with a direct deployment of the rescue swimmer, so he's not going to detach from the hoist. He's just going to go straight down, throw a, a rescue strap around the survivor, and then be hoisted right back into the aircraft. It's usually the fastest way to pull someone out of the water. I got lower down with direct deployment. Immediately after getting in the water, my hands start going numb right off the bat. My heart starts racing a little bit. I know this is a serious situation for them. I swam up to her first survivor and tried to get the, the quick strop around her head. Like I said, my hands were numb. My, my goggles were, uh, were iced up. But once I verified that I had everything on properly, I gave the ready for pickup. Right five, somewhere survivor out of the water. Somewhere survivor coming up, easy down. As the hoist continued to go on, my gloves, my, my face was saturated. The rescue swimmer's gloves and, and his mask were actually saturated and freezing. When I reached out to grab the survivor, I couldn't feel my hand anymore. And I couldn't feel where the button was on the switch that was in my hand. So after we had her in the cabin and put her over in the corner and started getting her warmed up, I then tried to warm up my own hand because I couldn't feel it enough to make the next hoisting evolution a safe one. It was probably only a minute, but it felt like a world. It felt like 10 minutes that I was trying to just warm my hand up enough that I would be able to do the next hoist safely. The hard part was looking out the door, seeing the man that I'm wanting to save, and not being able to because my hand was too cold to do anything. But I pulled off my hoisting gloves. I was able to get my hand warmed up, and we went back after the next guy. And swimmer's ready. Roger. Survivors at 2 o'clock, you can begin the hoist. Have target sight. Load check's complete, swimmer's going down. Roger. And we briefed the same procedure with the direct deployment. I uh, swam up to it immediately. I, I noticed that he was in a, a more serious state of hypothermia. His arms were clenched close to his chest. His eyes were a little glazed over. So again, I tried to work as quickly as I could. Uh, I got the strop attached to him, took a few waves, and then we were hoisted into the cabin. Pulled him to the back of the cabin and then called hoist complete, and that was both survivors in the cabin. 
got them over under the troop seat and started getting them warmed up as best we could. And at that point, found out that there was another fishing vessel was coming on scene. Yeah, Coast Guard helicopter, uh, Tech Sydney. Tech Sydney, Coast Guard helicopter, go ahead. When we finished the second hoist, uh, the fishing vessel was only about 400 yards away from where the life raft was. We got five people in the life raft that made it aboard the Tech Sydney. Two people unaccounted for that did not make it to the raft. Roger, we have those two people on board our helicopter. We picked them up out of the water. If you have five, then uh, sounds like they're ones accounted for now. I was amazed how fast they were able to pick up the five survivors. We're like, man, they already get those guys. And um, so we called them on the radio and they're like, yeah, we got five people on board. And we knew everyone was uh, safely accounted for. It's just a real relief. Got back on deck in uh, Kodiak and uh, taxied in. Once we got out of the aircraft, we got the survivors to the medical assistance with the corpsmen that were on scene. It just really makes you feel good to come back and know that everyone's coming home safe tonight, including my crew. How are you feeling? Good. Warmed up, how are your fingers? Fine. Fingers and toes don't feel too bad? No, my toes are a little cold, but. Yeah. Other than that, you're feeling good, huh? Yeah. All right. My name is Jonathan Gutron, and I am a fisherman on the vessel Heritage. That was fun, right? You just yeah. right there. And I felt bad when we brought her up. My hands got so cold I couldn't control the pendant anymore. And uh, I had I had to do something because I couldn't lower the swimmer and raise him up. So I, I probably only waited like an extra 30 seconds or so, but it felt like so much longer. So I'm just sitting there trying to get it warmed up. There's nothing I can do. But uh, yeah, we got you as quickly as we could. You know, we started taking on water. The generator shut down. All the lights went out, and then uh, the steering went down. We knew that we were toast. We were listening really bad at that point. It was going under, so we all jumped up. I grabbed my wallet. I was thinking about grabbing my computer. When I was in the water, I realized that that thing was uh, not very important. When they finally called back from the boat that there was five people in the raft and five people had gotten on, that was a huge weight off of our shoulders. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, like this. Yeah, that was, uh, that was actually my first hoist, my first operational hoist. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, that's my first case. So that was, that was a lot of fun. That was a good one. Right on. Yeah, it was fresh for me, too. 60, 70 knot winds and 30 foot seas. That, yeah. was, that was pretty good. We were getting the life raft ready, and I was the last guy. Sarah and I were just barely able to pull ourselves out in the last second. And uh, when I poked my head under the water, all I could see was the rigging, the top of the rigging and strobe lights all around, and I didn't know which one was a raft and which one were, you know, empty suits and what have you. So I just kind of uh, put my head back and tried to stay calm, you know. Just getting a wave in my mouth, you know, salt water in my mouth, and just trying to breathe and calm my heartbeat, collect my thoughts, you know, enjoy the, the last remaining moments of my life, potential life. We were in the water for about 20 or 25 minutes. I saw the life raft, but it was too far for me to get to. I had my strobe light on. I held it in the air and just waited for the uh, Coast Guard to come. Yeah, finally that sodium light hovered on me, and I was getting pretty cold. I was starting to shake uncontrollably, and I knew that hypothermia was coming soon. But I was hanging out with the Coast Guard, so I knew it was all right. You came in and you gave me a smile. I was like, that's so cool. Bro, I'm just stoked yeah. that you're, stoked you're all right. That's it's good cool. to meet you. Right, you wish you could have been under better conditions. Huh? We were extremely lucky with the Coast Guard just to know it's another lifeline. <laughs> um, yeah, when you're bobbing around in the water and you see the helicopter, it's, it's a great feeling. <laughs>
great job, Jason. Thank you. Jason's been up all night. It's been, been a bit of hectic. I appreciate everybody coming in and, and those flying right now, slugging it out in those winds and conditions. That third crew that was going on scene got diverted. We closed that case down, so we only got one up on the uh, Kimberly. Once we were confident that we had all seven uh, crew members from the fishing vessel Heritage safe, we heaved a sigh of relief on that case and uh, went back to our original problem. We still had four people in very dire straits up there on the fishing vessel, Kimberly. Just a uh, few thoughts from my perspective. Uh, you've all heard me say this a couple times. At some point during your tour here, you're gonna be pushed to your limits and beyond. And uh, tonight's one of those nights when the case really gets tough and the challenges really come hot and heavy. You really have to be ready. And a couple crews tonight found out what it's like to be pushed to their limits and have to come back unsuccessful, but they made the right decision. They made the right choices. So we're still in the game, uh, still doing a great job out there, but you gotta be ready to go at a moment's notice. All right, if uh, nobody has any other questions, I guess we'll call it good. Get to work. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually pretty funny because I was sleeping pretty good and the audio calls me. Uh, he says, hey Jim, we need you coming for a star case. And I was still pretty groggy and just responded, why are you calling me? I, I don't have duty. And he's like, yeah, yeah I, I know. We, we need a lot of crews right now. Come on in. And I jumped up and came to work. How are you feeling? Uh, good. OK. Adequate crew rest at least, uh, I want to say, uh, maybe a two for me, <laughs> or whatever you're thinking. Medium to high. Yeah. Alex, how we go? That was scary, sir. You guys no. going to the... Uh, We're going Kimberly. Portage Bay? Yeah. Vince Jensen had just uh, returned from the case. He was the second crew out there. And uh, yeah, he was pretty, uh, he was shaken. It was some of the most challenging environment he's ever flown in. He told me exactly what he saw, where it was at, what he encountered. So here's the deal. We saw peak winds at 90, 90 knots, but it's really gusty. And then all these kind of coves right here are all full of sea ice. And it's this real kind of wispy fog that's just being blown. You know, it's half sea spray and half fog. I was able to talk to uh, Jim and Jess together. Uh, I told them on scene conditions, no joke turbulence, no joke icing. The conditions here are really good, but on scene they were pretty treacherous. All right. Of course, we wanted to get out there as quickly as we can, but you know the weather was so demanding that yeah, we're all a little nervous. You could look at in everybody's eyes. You could tell, okay, this is it. This is the A game. Let's go. I got a makeshift one there. You got these normal three trail lines, extra four weight bags. Yeah. So that's what I got at this point. When we took off, it was still nighttime, it was still dark. The big thing, though, for uh, my crew in particular was we knew we would be arriving on scene with some daylight hours. That's a huge benefit in us being able to successfully complete the mission. Now we climbed up to 5,000 feet, and we only had 10 knots of wind, and we were almost disappointed going, well, this is not so bad. But come to find out, it's just because we haven't really closed the gap on that 115-mile range. And about halfway there, we started picking up winds at 30 knots, 40 knots, suddenly come 50 knots, 60 knots. Then once we got below 2,000 feet or so, it became a little bit more steady. Uh, still turbulent, but you know, light to moderate at best. All right, yeah, the door's coming open. Just... Ooh, it's cold out. What was amazing was we picked up the life raft from quite a ways out. And we couldn't see the boat. And that's how well it blended into the background, because it was totally covered in ice. We did happen to notice as we got close, there was one individual who was standing outside the raft. We started looking for places to hoist me down so I could make communications and see what we could do from there. Yeah, this doesn't look like anything for me. Uh, how about you guys? How's it feel up front? This is great. Let's stay right here. OK. Get to swim around the hook, sir. Roger. So we got ourselves in a position about 100 feet directly over the vessel. Ready for harness deploy the rest of the floor. Do that check, Summer? Ready check, Summer. Target inside, begin the hoist. Target, target inside. Low check storm. Low check, please. Storm is going down. We thought we couldn't make a safe deployment to the frozen sea ice. The first thing I'm thinking is get myself secure, the footing good, make sure that I'm good, uh, send the hoist hook back up, and go assess the situation. Up to do a fall, Rick. Over, how do you reach? 
Red Schwimmer, this is 05, have you loud and clear? All right, Roger. Uh, uh, one individual standing beside me, one individual in the raft, two guys on board the boat. When I initially approached him, it, I come to find out it was the captain of the vessel. He was severely hypothermic at that point. He advised me there was one member in the raft who was incapacitated, couldn't get out of the raft, and then there was two on the vessel itself. The next thing I did was climbed up, checked with the two guys in there, and made sure they were good to go, let them know the intentions. I asked one of them to assist me with the elderly gentleman in the raft. Uh, the individual in the raft says he can't really stand up on his own, so probably need to get the basket as close to him as I can. Uh, and we'll try to get him muscled over into the basket. Yeah, let's do that. We'll get it, we'll get the basket right to him. That's going to store. That's going down. That's going down. That's on deck, easy, right? They're putting the survivor in the basket. Okay. The gentleman who remained in the raft, when I came up on him, uh, he let me know he couldn't move his lower extremities. You could tell he was fatigued. And I said, well, I'll get you out of there. Just hang tight a minute. I was able to get the gentleman up. The other individual grabbed his feet. And then I repositioned and grabbed him around by his trunk. And then I set him in the basket. Basket, clear the deck, clear back and left easy. Once the basket came in the cabin, I realized I'm going to have to get this guy out of there. Uh, and being that he had no use of his legs and that the deck was iced up, I knew it was going to be a struggle. Green basket, it's a uh, cabin door. So I got him, told him to help me as best he could get him out. He's helping him get out in the back. Nope, you gotta get him out. His legs aren't working. It's too cold. Bringing basket. It's a cabin door. Basket is a cabin door. Once the basket came in the cabin, I realized I'm gonna have to get this guy out of there. Being that he had no use of his legs, I knew it was going to be a struggle. He's helping him get out in the back. Nope, you got to get him out. Roger. His legs aren't working. It's just too cold. You're doing good, Josh. You're doing good. Roger. I know it's a lot of work. Oh, no, no worries. Once we got the first survivor set up in the cabin in the seat, after that struggle was over, we just decided that we are going to keep doing basket hoist. Hey, ready to send the basket back out the door. Roger that. Continue hoisting, please. Roger. That's good. The captain of the vessel was the next one to go up. They had on his nose, uh, it looked like uh, the beginnings of frostbite. Um, that's a sure sign. He's got a lot of hypothermia, a lot of exposure. Are they ready for pickup signal? Easy yeah. forward, taking the load. We started hoisting him, got him up, bringing it in the cabin door, and I started slipping on the uh, ice. All right, the deck slippery back here for that guy. Brought some snow in. Oh. Uh, pretty abnormal. Uh, but I would like you guys to uh, help me uh, with the hoist. What was happening, instead of the basket being pulled in, he was almost pulling himself out of the cabin because the decks were so slick. He asked us up front to control the hoist. Bump, 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 bump. You hear him say bump, 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 and my co-pilot is basically bumping the hoist down for him because he needed both hands, and you can actually see how he's using his foot to brace himself so he doesn't pull himself out of the cabin. Max inside cabin door. Great job up front. Great job up front. Woo, you're working hard, Josh. He's just trying to get the second survivor up on the seat. It's nice to have a little narration coming from the co pilot. <laughs> He's got the cable on the deck. Everything looks good out there. Ready to go, pass it out the door. Roger that. Uh, continue on when you're ready and call me as you need me. We continued uh, basket hoisting for two more times. The other two went very, very quick. I uh, couldn't believe how fast Josh got that done. Basket inside cabin door. Out of the basket. Oh, that was fast. You're an animal. Then we just got Chief back with a bear hook recovery. Swimmer. Inside cabin door. Whistle, Woo! Nice job, Chief. Everything worked out. I got inside the cabin. I was covered in ice at this time. I still had not regained any kind of dexterity in my hands. I was having to ask Josh to open up the bags for the blankets. You ready for forward flight? Ready for forward flight, sir. Just another busy officer, Big Daddy. Nicely done. Once my hands came back to, the uh, main thing was getting the guys out of their wet clothing. I gave them some liquids. Uh, it's lukewarm li liquids, not cold, not hot. Both of the uh, elderly gentlemen, their core temperatures had dropped pretty low. They were all dehydrated. You could tell they were in pretty dire straits. But these gentlemen were fighters. 
they did uh, everything that they could in their power to prepare and try to be in the right conditions and you know, fortunately it worked out. Coming feet first, guys. All right. All right. Nice and gentle. Nice and gentle. Right. 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 My name is Richard Sharp, uh, crew member on the Kimberly. All I could say is, uh, if it wasn't for the Coast Guard, uh, we wouldn't have made it. We went ashore, started hitting the rocks pretty hard on the bottom. Then after that, we were getting bounced around pretty good. The swell would hit us that she would roll quite a bit. Then we did lean over and figured, oh. That don't look good. I've got nothing but the highest praise for the Coast Guard. I don't know any uh, other name you could call them besides heroes. Hey, nice job up there, nice sir. Very nice. Well, they had to be following, you know? That was Thanks. awesome. They had to be following. <laughs> Unbelievable. Everybody was very relieved when we finally got him back here. You know, we don't want to leave anybody behind. And obviously, it worked out for the best in this case. It took uh, a, a whole air station of 350 to really make this happen. And that's why we all come up here. This is the big boy game. This is uh, where great rescues are made. Nice job, gents. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Awesome case. Thanks, Cap. Nice job. It was just an amazing, um, heroic effort. Herculean effort by everybody involved to do all the things that needed to be done. Great job. Thanks. No worries. Awesome. <laughs>